Gentlemen, good evening. good evening! This is Johnny Dennis welcoming you once again to the world famous City of Artists in Leeds. Each week in this series on BBC Radio 2, we meet artists who have a special affection for this warm and friendly theatre. In 1865, when it was built, you could escape for a few hours in an atmosphere of bonhomie and tobacco smoke. See a dozen acts, drink some ale, and join in the chorus singing. That atmosphere, albeit without the smoke, was captured brilliantly by Barney Colehan when he produced the good old days from here. <laughs> our, our two guest stars tonight were always welcome on that show. Ladies and gentlemen, Hinge and Brackett! <laughs> Lovers. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's so lovely to be back here at the City Variety Leeds after all these years. <laughs> oh, it really is. Now, for those of you who have not had the pleasure of us before, <laughs> I am Dame Hilda Brackett, and this is my colleague and oldest friend for many years, yes. Dr. Van Hinch. Hello. And of course, <laughs> We are celebrating 50 years in the business because we originally met in 1945. And, oh, yes. 46, yeah. dear. What? 46. 45, it was. 46, Hilda. 45, dear, I remember it. It was 1946, Hilda. 1945. 46? <laughs> <Yes. laughs> However, I was a member of the Rosa Charles Opera Company, mm. you see, and I was sitting in the stalls of the old Empire Theatre Snitterton, which is in the Midlands, surrounded on four sides by Birmingham. Mm. And 
I was sitting in at a dress rehearsal for the opera Carmen, of which I was playing the leading Nelly, role. Nelly, Aida, dear. Hmm? What? The opera was Aida, not Carmen. Carmen. Carmen it was, dear. It was Aida. I remember it distinctly, my dear. It was Carmen. It was Aida. I should know. I was singing the role of Carmen. I should know what it was. Well, you may have been singing the role of Carmen. The rest of the cast were singing Aida. <laughs> Well, whichever it was, it's easy to mix them up. They're both continental. However, <laughs> I was sitting there, you see, with the score on my lap, and I had round my shoulders the top half of my twin set, and on my lap a box of chocolates, you see. Suddenly there was a commotion at the end of my row, and this tall, angular girl appeared in a Gannix raincoat and, you know, <laughs> gum boots with a banjo and watering can on her back. <laughs> just in case it didn't rain, she'd make her own. And she was saying, I want to sit in that empty seat there, which was on my right-hand side. So we all had to stand up to let her come mm. through, you see. Well, just as she was drawing level with me, she caught the neck of her banjo in my box and down I went. <laughs> well, you can imagine, can't you? I thought I'd never see daylight again. I mean, for two minutes, I had to just blow down the neck of my blouse. Oh, there. Well, as she was going past, I bent down to retrieve my chocolates, you see, to receive a size 12 Goodyear boot on my right hand, crushing two of my fingers and completely destroying my noisy creams. <laughs> That's how we met. <laughs> yes. uh, and I said, I do beg your pardon. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Yverdne Mona Montpellier, Pauline René Hinge. And you see, quick as a flash, I say, well, you'll have to learn to live with it, won't you? <laughs> 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 and she'd been trying ever since. Yeah. But that was when we met, and I was leading lady with Rosa Charles, I was diva, and Yvonne had joined as an assistant to the assistant musical director. Now, this was what we used to call in those days a semi-menial task. Bear in mind, of course, I was a very young girl in those days, very 18 years old, something like that. Very young. It's hard to believe. Mm. <laughs> Looking at me, it's obvious I was, but however... Still am at sometimes. Anyway, so you see, she, as I say, had joined, and one of her jobs was to carry the scores from the van to the stage door. Now, you may say that's simple, but if we were doing the ring cycle, it took her a day. And then, of course, she progressed to the assistant musical director's mm, job. Mm. Now, this meant she became honorary page turner in the pit, didn't you? I did, that's right, yeah. That's right. Then if she got bored, she would take a grip out of her hair and put several pages together mm. and turn them at once. Mm. And that way, we used to cut two hours off the performance. But they were happy days, weren't they? Oh, they, they were lovely Touring days. with the opera company. We yes. would travel all around the country, and of course, one had to find a place to stay. So stay. we would stay in theatrical digs, digs. or lodgings, as, right. they were, as they were called in those years. And of course, that could be something of a lottery, because, mm. of course, some of them were very comfortable, well-appointed, and uh, well set up. Others were not quite so exciting. No, And no. I think if I had to pick the absolute nadir of theatrical digs, it would have to be that place in... Um, in um, Grange over there. Oh, don't, don't, don't. You remember that? Remember it? I'll never forget it if I live to be normal. No. Oh, I say. <laughs> and the landlady, what was her name again? Uh, Mrs. Malibu Oyricum. No, she I... was Czech. Yeah. Yes. And she had a very peculiar Christian name, did she not? Euthanasia. Euthanasia, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but what that woman could do with a kipper. Yeah. Oh. Oh, I'm not talking about performing now. Oh, do you know we had them till we looked like them? Yeah. She obviously had some arrangement with the Fisheries Commission because we had them morning, noon, and night every day of the week. Mind you, she would disguise them in cunning ways. Oh, yes. We, were, we had kippers fried, boiled, grilled. Sautéed. Stroganoff. Cold with salad. En croute. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, we did. Jean Kipper. We yeah, had, yes, frequently. Yes. Yeah. The last, yes. Well, by the day we were leaving, I said to her... Dame Hilda decided yes. she would play a prank I said, on I'm going to play a prank <laughs> on this woman, you see. <laughs> she got one of these kippers. So I got one of these kippers, you see. And, what and I she decided... concealed it. <laughs> I concealed it. in an intimate article of underwear, you see. And she decided... That's oh, it. I, but... If it had me, dear, this is my story. <laughs> Do you mind if I tell it? Carry on. Oh. Well, she could leave out something vital, you see, <laughs> like the punchline. Well, the day we were leaving, I secreted one of my breakfast kippers in the top of my riding boot. Then I returned to my room and I nailed it up at the back of the wardrobe. 
Now, you imagine a smelly kipper on a hot summer's day. Still there 20 years later, probably. <laughs> Well, not quite that long. It was there for some time. Well, it was, yes, I remember yes. she wrote to you about a year later, didn't she? Oh, it wasn't that long, dear. It was only about 12 months. Yeah. And she said, she said, we know what it is, but we don't know where it is. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, mind you, the food situation we could have dealt with, after all. You know, one makes do uh, with and things like that. But the real problem in that house was of quite a different order. You see, it was a theatrical lodging house. Yes. And we were at the Royal Hall with the opera. Company. And this is the days when, you know, towns had several theatres, not theaters. just the one. Mm. So the opera was at the Victoria Hall. Sort of yes. up the ladder, so right. to speak, yes. But there were people in the house who were not quite... Uh, well, she well. was theatrical digs, you see, so she had people from the theatre staying there. Mm. But she wasn't fussy about mixing them. No, that's right. And the weeks we were there, there were people also staying from the world of variety. Yes. Yes, mm. yes. And I'm sorry to say this, anywhere else but Leeds, this might sound snobbish, mm. but you see... <laughs> I've always believed you cannot mix Cotton Garden with a co-op hall. It no, doesn't I, work. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and you remember the couple on our landing. Oh, yes. A man and a woman. <sighs> Speaks for itself, doesn't it? <laughs> they were in variety. I'll say they were, yeah. They used to rehearse their act on the landing every morning between 7 and 7.30. Mm. There they would be out there doing it. Oh, it was frightful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Now, yes. they were called... Um, they were called uh, Punch and Deirdre. No, dear, no, no, no. They were no. called... Deirdre was her name. He was called... Sta uh, oh, Dan. Uh, Don. Dan. No, Dan. Dan, Dan, Dan and, and Deirdre. Dan and Desiree. Dan and Desiree. Yeah. Yes, she was Desiree, we as think. As far as we knew. Because <laughs> it's the old days of five and nine makeup. It was mm. very hard to tell. Yes, yes. <laughs> But I remember they did quite an intriguing act. It oh, yeah. What we yes. used to call in the old days an adagio act. No, it wasn't. It, it wasn't. It wasn't, dear. No, no, it wasn't. She forgets she's getting <laughs> I on. Don't, I, I saw them do it. Here. No, no, dear. And this is was how it went. Not an First adagio. of all, she would adopt a sort of cowering position and he would menace her with a whip. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but that wasn't their act. <laughs> They enjoyed that. <laughs> no, they were music and movement. Oh, are they? He supplied the music and she did all the moving. Oh. And he was on a unicycle with a banjolele, you see, and he would go up and down on this one wheel bicycle and she would dance round him and sort of do pirouettes and twiddle her ocarina. And <laughs> yes, twice on matinee days, it wore her out. And then she would do a high kick and she would always finish with the splits on the linoleum. Mm. And every time she went down, she whistled. <laughs> well, by the Thursday of the first week, I'd had more than I could take, which was unusual for me. So I said to Everdney, I'm going out there now to nip this in the bud before it has time to blossom. Right, right. So I put on my house coat, you know, that nice one with, with the, the door, door in the front. front. Yeah. And... I went out on the landing just in time to see him coming from the airing cupboard on his unicycle. You know. And she was on the point of going down in the splits. She had her head in the banisters. If I'd had a bun, I'd have fed her. And she looked at me and I looked at her and she said, Hilda Brackett, yeah, I want to do this every morning. You'll never catch a cold. <laughs> But you can't whistle, dear, can you? <laughs> but I've got fitted carpet in it. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Right. So those were touring days oh, with the yes. opera company. What fun they were. Oh, the we opera, didn't just do yes. the operas. We also did the operettas and the musical comedies, too, didn't we? Oh, the musical comedies. And all the Ivan Novello shows we did. And Noel Coward. Oh, Noel Coward, yes. Vivian Ellis. Oh, Vivian Ellis. Oh, what lovely shows Vivian wrote. Uh, Vivian Ellis is a man, by the way, man. in case you didn't know. Yes. 
Well, the name Vivian is one of those ambiguous names Difficult that name. can cause problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know the sort of problem because I, I have a cousin, Evelyn. He was in the guards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only for two weeks. Mm -hmm. He was invalided out. <laughs> And it was all very silly, really. It's so long ago. I mean, purely for singing Kiss Me Goodnight, Sergeant Major. <laughs> and apparently he did, and they were both thrown out. Mm. But anyway, that was that. But oh, they were lovely. The novello shows, they were very much our kind of style. Yes, they were. They? Lovely songs. Of course, I've all sadly departed this life in 1951. And he'd been appearing in King's Rhapsody at the Oak Palace Theatre in Cambridge Circus. And just across the road at the Savile, his last musical, Gaze the Word, was playing. Now he'd written this in conjunction with Jack Halbert, Alan Melville, and it was for Jack's wife, Cicely Courtnich, to play the lead. Now, of course, we all loved Ivor so much. His music has lived on. And in that show, Sis sang a song which seems to say everything about the way we felt about dear Ivor. my way just stopped to say a word of greeting this let's pretend would end there and then the very moment when my heart stopped beating if only he turned to smile that little one, however fleeting, would always see a dream to dream today. If only he looked my way. The first time I was conscious of him, I was doing my little dance, one of those shottish things. Oh, they don't do them anymore today. And he was sitting in the stage box. I saw a mess of curly hair and a white gardenia. He always wore a white gardenia. And at the end of my dance, he threw it onto the stage. It landed at my feet. I picked it up and he seemed so upset. Afterwards, he came round to apologize. And the next night, and the night after that, and the night after that too. Oh, it was my big romance. And to him, just one of those things. Then later, later when he went away, which was so casual, I just carried on dancing, my little Shatish. But I've often wondered, what would it have been like? If only he looked my way. You're listening to the City of Varieties on BBC Radio 2, and our guests are Hinge and Bracken. Leonard has changed, hasn't he, Dan? <laughs> what, eh? What did you say? I said, Leonard looks rather different than I remember him. <laughs> well, that's, that's because this isn't Leonard. You mean Mr. Satchers? Yes, to be here. Yeah, well, you see, <laughs> Leonard Satchers is no longer here, dear. Uh, where's he gone? <laughs> He's joined Barney Colhern up in the big, <laughs> the big variety show in the sky. She's not been out for a long time, who, you see. Who, 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 
Who, who is this? This is Danny Jonas. <laughs> who here? Who do you say to? Dennis Johns. <laughs> Glynis Johns? I don't think so. No, 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 not Mervyn's sister. You remember... <laughs> you remember Doreen Hermitage? Yes. Well, this was Doreen Hermitage. Oh! <laughs> She was a Leeds experiment. <laughs> a very successful one, if I may say so. Well, particularly around the hairline. Yes. Yes, very good. yes well, now we've got that out of the way. <laughs> uh, I think we might get back to the subject. I was talking about Barney. What yeah. memories of you of Barney Colohan? Oh, dear Barney. Oh, twirling his moustache, because yeah. he couldn't do it himself. Um, <laughs> The wonderful evenings we had here, you know, in the early days. Oh, it was marvellous. And, and just being here and seeing that white moustache and hearing his chains clanking round the building. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Of course, you've not only appeared in this country, but you've been uh, appearing in the Empire. I understand you went to South Africa recently. We've just returned. Just come back ago. from there. Yes. Yes. How did you find that? It was there when we got just off the plane. <laughs> And of course, you, uh, you've been to Australia. You're very famous in oh, Australia. Oh, yes, yes. How did the Australian audiences uh, warm to your style of humour? Well, I think that they, they, they warmed to us because the temperature was pretty hot. <laughs> and they sat there with their legs crossed in their shorts and their cans of lager, you know, and the corks around their hats. Yeah. Evadne felt very much at home. Yes, I did, actually, yes. She'd had a hat like that for years and mm -hmm. never a chance to wear it. <laughs> so, yes. And the but, nerve to wear it, really. But yeah. they were lovely to us, you know. Mm. They bent over backwards to please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's quite They couldn't do enough for us, could they, dear? No, so they didn't bother half no. the time. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the great stars. Any memories of the great stars in musical comedy that you had the pleasure of sharing a stage or two with? Oh, well, over the years, of course, there's been many. There was, of course, the great pantomime dame, Clarkson Rose. Yes. And again, in pantomime, George Lacey. George Lacey, yeah. Uh, great Ar favourite of Dame Hilda's, George Oh, Lacey. yes, yes, he was, yes. Mm -hmm. Arthur Askey. Yeah. Nellie Wallace. <gasps> yeah. Yes. Elsie and Doris Waters. Yeah. Oh, weren't they, what, you see that? You mentioned their name, they go, ooh. <laughs> Hello, Gator. Do you still do pantomime? Oh, oh yes, yeah. dear, yes. Well, last Christmas we did Beauty and the Beast. Mm. <laughs> I was very attractive in that. <laughs> Evadne got away without wearing any makeup at all. But, uh, I don't she, know what you're trying to imply, Hilda. Well, you just came on and frightened the children to death. I mean. <laughs> And I was playing the Wicked Witch. I was supposed to frighten the children to death. Yes, but you see, when the beast came on, they all thought he was attractive. <laughs> oh, yes, we love being on tour. And, of course, you know, at our age now, we get so well looked after. It really is As a rule. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, Denzel, I wonder... <laughs> Could you go to the bar and get a little, you know... Refreshment. Sort of refreshment for Evadne and myself? Yes. Uh, what would you like? Well, I think you'll have your usual, won't you, dear? If they have it, yeah. Large complan. Complan. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, three heap tablespoons in her beaker. And uh, do, you, do you want sugar, dear? No, 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 sugar, my mother. Was was glucose. Two, two yes. drops. Two drops from an eyedropper of glucose. In the camera. And then fill her beaker two-thirds full with tepid water. Yeah, tepid, not boiling like last time. Otherwise, her lip will come up like a balloon, you yes. know. <laughs> And then I can't play my kazoo then, can that's I? That's right. I'll get her glasses on properly. Mm. And then when you put the lid on her beaker, try and get the two spouts to meet, all right? Because <laughs> we don't want to happen what happened last time. It all went down her blouse, and I don't think it'll stand another dry clean. And I'll have my usual. That's from the long green bottle with the cork that hits the ceiling. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's just a little of that. And uh, a sliver of smoked salmon on rye bread there. Do you want a dry biscuit there? <laughs> cheese straw. Right. Denzel, half a cheese straw there and just show it the butter wrapper. <laughs> Right.
Right, I'll be back in a jiffy. Yeah. Oh, but I thought he was never going to I go. Know. Look, well, trouble is, you see, they think Look, they're stars. Someone mm. asleep in the front row. Good heavens, yes. Who is it? It's Paul Stead. The producer? Yes. Oh. I know how we can wake him up. How? We'll sing the last night of the prom. What a good idea. <laughs> Gentlemen, we would like you to join us now in a good night chorus. So we're going to recreate very briefly the last night of the proms here at the City Variety Leeds. So, just for a moment's sake, imagine you're in the Royal Albert Hall. Well, one of the boxes, anyway. And it's the moment after Elgar's been variated, and everybody's rushing up and down, shouting, Up, Sir Colin Davis! Up, Sir Colin Davis! <laughs> he takes it all in his stride, bless him. Now, Yvette is going to be uh, joined here by the massive orchestra here to get the real effect, and it is at this moment in the programme we would invite onto the platform to sing the leading part in the promenade, Dame Kirita Kanawa. Unfortunately, her bus went straight past. <laughs> So you've got me. Now, I start it off, you come in the second time round, all right? But you know, by being here today, you've made two old ladies very happy. <laughs> and when I see them, I'll tell them. <laughs> The City of Varieties was produced by Paul Stead and is a PSTV radio production for BBC Radio 2.